Hi, everyone. Welcome to Waste 360's Nothing Wasted podcast. On every episode, we invite the most interesting people in waste, recycling, and organics to sit down with us and chat candidly about their thoughts, their work, this unique industry, and so much more. So thanks for listening and enjoy this episode. Good morning. My name is Jocelyn Cladaniel. I am with Municipal Equipment located in Kentucky and I serve as the Professional Development Chair of the National Waste and Recycling Women's Council. Thank you for joining me this morning. Nearly two de decades ago, the NWRA Women's Council was formed by like-minded industry professionals dedicated to advancing and promoting the waste and recycle industry, along with giving back to our members and their companies through education, networking, professional development, and the award of academic scholarships. A huge thank you to our member companies who have donated to our scholarship program to join in the celebration of the NWRA's 60th anniversary. NWRA Women's Council awarded $60,000 and scholarships for the 2022-2023 academic year. This scholarship amount also highlights a massive milestone for the Women's Council, awarding over $300,000 in scholarships since 2007. Today's spotlight session is an excellent example of the work accomplished by my Women's Council colleagues. I'd like to introduce our monitor, moderator, Samantha Podgorny. Sam is the Senior Manager of Digital Solutions at Environmental Solutions Group. She serves as the Marketing Chair for the NWRA Women's Council and led ESG's flagship diversity and inclusion group, the Women of ESG. Thank you, Jocelyn, and good morning. The waste and recycling industry is an excellent and often overlooked career, especially for women. The National Waste and Recycling Association's Women's Council has proudly seated a panel of amazing female professionals who represent a wide variety of roles. Thank you for investing time with us today to learn from our panelists as they share their experiences, best practices, and offer advice to others looking to grow within or join our ever-changing industry. We will also discuss challenges they face and the new innovations and technologies they are using on the job. The waste industry has traditionally been predominantly male, not only by the numbers, but also by society and culture's perception of people working within this field. I'd like to extend a warm welcome to our panelists who have worked hard to break these barriers and perceptions and forge paths for others. So here's the format to give you an idea of what to expect. First, we'll take a few minutes for each of our panelists to briefly introduce themselves. I'll then kick off the conversation. And finally, we'll, uh, we'll open up the floor to questions. I'd like to first welcome Kim Lewick, who serves as Operations and Office Manager at Papillion Sanitation, a waste connections company in Omaha, Nebraska. Kim? Please share a little bit about yourself and why you decided to join the waste and recycling industry. My name is Kim Loick, and I work for Waste Connections, Papillion Sanitation in Omaha, Nebraska. I'm currently doing a dual role of both operations and office manager. I've been in the industry for 30 years, and how I got in the industry is quite a story. Um, I was actually looking for a part-time job, going through school, 20 years old. I'm thinking, okay, well, I could do this. And 30 years later, here I am. So it is definitely ha has been a ride um, and, and would not change anything for it. Our next panelist is Dominica Farmer, Area Vice President for, of the Gulf Coast for WM. Dominica, what is your background and what influenced you to join this industry? All right, thank you and good morning everyone. Well, I, April marked 30 years 
that I've been with WM um, right out of college. And so from a professional standpoint, um, my experience has crossed many disciplines. It started in sales, it moved to collection operations, then post-collection operations and transfer stations. Um, and I lead a team of 1,700, and I don't call them employees, our teammates across a four-state area. From a personal perspective, I'm a mother of two, almost an empty nester, and I've been married to a wonderful husband for 27 years. Um, so it was about, I was graduating from college in April, so it was around December timeframe. Very involved in the chamber, very involved um, with, you know, with the Economic Development Council. I try to do quite a bit of, of that. Um, and I met a district manager, a gentleman there uh, at one of the chamber events. He had enthusiasm. He was excited about the vision of WM. And I thought to myself, wow, his one voice was truly the trigger for me because I had choices at that time. And he is what someone who persuaded me just because of his enthusiasm for the industry. Excellent. Uh, Norma Yanez joins us from GFL Environmental, where she serves as government contracts manager in beautiful North Carolina. Norma, what attracted you to the industry? Well, I think I'm the oldest one as far as how many years in the industry and probably the oldest one period up here. But uh, 32 years ago, I had moved to coastal North Carolina. And at that time, uh, it was basically tourism. Um, that was the only type job that you could get. Uh, I had two small sons. I needed to make a living to be able to support myself. There was no Indeed. There was no LinkedIn. The only way you got a job is if you knew somebody or if you saw it in the newspaper. Well, I saw it in the newspaper. You know, garbage company sales. I'm like, eh, I don't care about the garbage company. I had been a roof supervisor and worked in the boiler rooms before, so trash didn't bother me one bit. So I applied for the job, and here I am 32 years later. Loved it. Now let's welcome Paige Coakley with Win Waste Innovations, who has served as driver operator. Paige, what do, drew you to our industry's front line? Desperation. <laughs> <laughs> um, so for me, um, gosh, I, to be able to sit up here with these women is incredible. I mean, I'm, I'm a driver. Um, I was fortunate enough um, to marry well. Um, I raised eight children, and so that was basically what I did with my life. <laughs> I was a mom. So um, about seven years ago, um, my former husband found his version of Yoko Ono. <laughs> and so my marriage was, was done, and I wasn't really sure what to do. No education, not even a high school diploma, guys. Um, just mom. And so I uh, had no idea. And I was suffering, you know, being kind of cast out of the circles of the doctor's wife and, you know, what am I going to do? And this woman who was a friend of mine said, will you stop crying? Go fly a plane or drive a truck. We're tired of listening to you. So <laughs> the next day I went down and I signed up to get a CDL because that, in my opinion, was the most money that I could make to save my family. Um, and I did. And it was tough. Oh my God. <laughs> um, I was, did you ever see Private Benjamin? This is Private Benjamin. <laughs> I went to driving school and there were like 30 guys. I was the only girl. And of course I came with my jewelry and my earrings and, and you know, my coach bag because that was the life that I came from. <laughs> and, um, and they were tough on me. And I, I remember, you know, breaking down and, and you guys are killing me. I, I, I can't fail. You can't fail me out of school. I have nowhere to go. And they said, we're just making sure that when you're out there on the road, you're going to do it. You're going to survive. And I did. And so in six weeks, I was a cross country driver. I remember the first time I got in a tractor trailer and I was like, oh my God, I'm going to die. <laughs> you know, what are all these buttons and what is it? What are, okay. So six weeks later, I'm blasting from New Jersey to Portland, Oregon, by myself, banging gears in a Kenworth, singing, having a great time, and making money, and taking care of my family. So instead of you know, suffering, I found something that has now blossomed into a career for me. Um, I'm, I have to be honest, because I'm not really good at hiding the truth, even though I'm Irish. 
Um, <laughs> I actually have now, at 54, um, I turned 54 in March, um, and my kids are adults, and, and this was a hard winter for me in the truck. It really was. So I, I looked to my company and I said, you know, um, it's time to get rid of the steering wheel. Is there anything else that I can bring with or do with my company where I don't have to find myself back where I was years ago, again, no diploma? And they're like, you know what? Yeah, we can use you. We can use your experience. And so now I'm um, executive in sales and I bring with me all of the ops information. So here I am and what turned out to be like tragedy that I thought I was done um, when my husband left is the best thing he ever did because now I have my own career and I don't need my doctor husband Sorry guys, but I make my own money and and it, life couldn't be better. So <clears throat> Our final panelist is Jennifer Saluski vice president business and technical development for Bayshore Recycling Corp Jennifer what led you to our great industry? Good morning, everyone. That is a really tough act to follow, <laughs> so I'll try. Um, I went to, uh, to school for engineering. I'm an engineer by trade, environmental. Um, I was working right out of school for a consulting firm, and then around like 2007, the market started to shift a little bit, and um, our work in environmental remediation was the funding was being pulled, and it was a strange time. So um, I, I started working for um, Bayshore, which was a client of a client of my client. So um, doing their regulatory compliance, um, I started out just doing that for their thermal desorption unit for uh, soil remediation. And then um, after some time, I started uh, doing other things, uh, looking at scheduling logistics, how to uh, improve efficiencies at Bayshore. Then I um, was promoted to vice president where I also managed the sales team and the technical team. Um, I grew the technical team and the sales team. So I have um, staff that um, it's a, a great team that we have and we're able to accomplish so much together. So I just, um, I've been there for about 14 and a half years now and I love it. Um, and I can't see myself ever leaving this industry. There's so much opportunity and, um, you know, not even just uh, for women, but in, you know, for people in general. Um, and having that, that great team and support around us is just what, you know, what makes it so much fun and to be able to be at the helm of, of all the changes that are happening and to help shape the regulations and, you know, in ways that work for the actual business has just been tremendous for me. So that's it. Well, welcome again to our extraordinary panelists. Now let's jump right in. John Maxwell said, leaders become great not because of their power, but for their ability to empower. Norma, who has served as your inspirational industry mentor, who has helped you develop in your career, and what did you learn from them? When I started out 32 years ago, I did commercial sales, but then about 17 years ago, I uh, converted over to governmental um, municipal type theater of work where you know I worked with the counties and the towns and contracts and bids and those kind of things. And back then, when I worked for Waste Industries, we were still a small type company. Um, we were in North Carolina and a little bit in South Carolina, a little bit in Virginia. And there was only one other person that did this job in the whole company. So the goal was, you know, they gave me the end goal, which was to bring in as much municipal work as possible. But it was up to me to figure out how to do all that. So I had, to, I had my own training program that I, that I did for myself. Uh, I worked mainly with uh, one regional uh, area vice president specifically, and uh, he was who I reported to, who I did all the work for, and he was very, very old school, let me tell you. You weren't on time unless you were five minutes early. Uh, he, his favorite saying was, they may uh, outsmart me, but they're never going to outwork me. And he had such a tremendous work ethic. Uh, I worked l alongside him for a long time. Sometimes I would get to a point where I really didn't know what I was supposed to do or how to do something. And he looked at me, he says, I guess you need to go figure it out then, don't you? And, uh, I, it's, and I think he knew that I knew what I was supposed to do, but I was just trying to use him as a crutch. But, but anyway, and he was always there if I had a problem. I always knew that he would be there. And, you know, and after a few years, uh, uh, he, he, he complimented me, he encouraged me, he, um, uh, told everybody what my abilities were, and it made me, and I was very proud that he thought that of me. Um, he, um, he also um, 
working with them. You could like say, oh, call him up. Oh, well, guess what? I signed a $2 million deal today. And he would always say back, well, on Friday, you can go home five minutes early then. So that's just <laughs> the type of guy he was. And uh, I think uh, myself and everybody that worked for him always worked as hard as they could work just to make, make him proud of us. So I think he, that would be the one that probably influenced me the most. Kim, WCN leadership speak often about their servant leadership training program. Have you also been inspired and or mentored by a servant leader within your career? Absolutely. If anyone knows Waste Connections, they have a strong servant leadership model. And early on, talking about 30 years ago, it, it, was, it was tough to, in this industry, as, as a woman. But the biggest role model that I had was probably early on with Waste Connections before they even rolled out their servant leadership model. It was a guy that came in, he was the new district manager, and he was new to the role, he was new to Nebraska, he really didn't know where Nebraska was until he was actually there, and then he wanted to get out as quickly as possible. <laughs> but anyway, uh, he gave, me, he gave me a chance. He came in and he didn't listen to anyone else. He formed his own opinion. And I realized quickly that he was there to help everyone. And it didn't matter if you were a male or a female, he was there to make sure that person was successful. And to, to him, I mean, it, it was him that made me want to be a better person. It made me want to, to push harder and, and be where I'm at now. Um, it even just his willingness to, to believe in me made me want to go back to school and to be a better person for it. And I, I owe a lot to that person. Um, he did eventually leave Nebraska, but it, it was just an opportunity that he Coming into my life is it's something that I'm very grateful for and owe a lot to. Jennifer, you've worn several hats throughout your 14 years at Bayshore. Will you share your leadership style, how you lead others, and if how it may differ from your male counterparts? Yeah. Sure. Um, so, you know, leadership to me is, uh, is, a, is a funny thing. I never knew that I had qualities to be a leader until I was in the position. And then I realized like, well, you know, I have a team of people that, you know, come to me for answers. And um, it's, it's very humbling, um, in my opinion, because I, I don't know. I don't know why. Um, people to think that people you know will come and want to hear what I have to say even even now is kind of insane for me so I um, and I appreciate it so uh, you know it's I, I feel like um, you know it's a really important to collaborate um, to bring people together to be good good um, to you know, work towards common goals, um, and then also cultivate everyone's individual um, goals as well, and uh, let people flourish in what they're good at. Let them enjoy their jobs, and um, and then you know it just it creates a, a more cohesive situation um, to you know get to where we need to get to. Whether it's the end of the day, whether we're putting out you know um, I don't want to say a fire, but you know in this industry we don't. <laughs> but um, but you know just uh, whatever fire drills there are and, and everything else, but. Um, I think it's really, really important to um, just, you know, communicate trust in your in your team, and um, and then you know, and then you get to you know achieve great things together. Dominica, I'd imagine you have a very full plate overseeing the Gulf Coast region of WM. How have you found success in leadership, and do you see any difference with your style as opposed to your colleagues? say that you know, leadership is the true cornerstone of what I do each and every day. Um, so as we talk about servant leadership, and I'm so glad because that to me is what I strive for, and the reason for that is because that's putting people first. Okay, we all know, especially in the um, you know climate of today, they are you know people do have choices, but putting people first, making them the priority. 
And you have to be intentional about it. You can't just say you're going to do it. If you really want to recruit great talent and truly be a servant leader, then you make them the priority. Um, you are obviously a great listener. You, you create vision. And when I think of uh, my, my tenure, my 30 years at WM, it was so important to make sure that all of our teammates understood what the vision was, right? Because if you can rally the team behind the vision, that's really when true success happens. And then lastly, so besides being, you know, having servant leadership and putting our people first and creating that vision, it's also about being authentic. It's about having, being genuine with others and treat them the way you want to be treated. So it seems very, you know, simplistic. There are a lot of, obviously, um, very, you know, we have priorities in our organization. And, um, but, you know, the, the, it, it begins with people first. And so that's, that's what I believe in. That's what I believe has made all us successful as a group. Excellent. Norma, your role as a leader is a little different in that you do not have any direct reports, but serve as a leader in your organization and the communities that you serve. How would you describe your leadership style and that of your male colleagues? Well, like you said, I've been very fortunate in 32 years, I've never had anybody have to report to me, which means that I've never had to, to take care of anybody, which to me is very good. But just because you don't have any reports don't, does not mean that you're not a leader in your own way. Um, I played a lot of sports in high school and college and even after that. If you ever play on a sports team, you learn how to work together, you learn how to strategize, you learn how to win, and you learn how to lead. So I think all those years really, um, really helped me in, in, in what I determine as my leadership style. I'll drag you kicking and screaming until we get through a project. Um, I have a lot of very new, young general managers, and like I said, I do municipal sales, so I have like uh, branches and facilities all over the state of North Carolina that I work with and deal with. You know, when they come up, if they come up through operations, they really don't understand doing municipal work. Or sometimes when they transfer over from a company, another company, they don't have that much municipal work. So I like to take them in, with me to meetings and to board meetings. Some of them don't even know what Robert's rules are. Uh, you know, just so they can see, you know, if I fall down and break my hip, you know, what they're going to have to do if I'm not around to help them. I try to make myself accessible. I try to be there when they need me, and I don't think there's anybody in a three-state area that doesn't call me every once in a while to ask me a question. Um, my favorite, I think my most used line that I have is, if it was me, I think I would blah, blah, blah. So, and a lot of them take my advice, and I try not to bully them, but um, I do feel like they're mothers sometimes, but, but they get to a point, I have to tell them I didn't take you to raise. Um, but anyway, so that's pretty much my being accessible and helping when they need my help. And, 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 and the, really they say when you get to a certain point in your career and you feel you've been successful, you get that feel to or urge to teach people. And I think I'm at that point where I'm trying to teach everybody everything that I know because I know so much after 32 years. I'm trying to make sure everybody in their local spots understands who does this, what is this, why we did that, how is this. And, you know, so I think that's part of it as well. As far as men management and women management styles, um, I've had good and bad of both. I think it's more of an individual style choice versus a gender style sh choice. I can point blank tell you the worst manager I've ever had was a woman. So, I mean, so don't get me wrong, 32 years ago, 32 years ago, it was an entirely different, um, a total different arena for as far as men and women in the industries. Uh, but having said that, you know what, you, you, um, you just learn the person you're working with and, 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 you, and you work it all out one way or the other. So. Paige, you also have a unique perspective. You've served as a frontline employee as a driver. Through that experience, what do you believe has been the most significant barrier in your career? Well, uh, well, it's been with my male um, co-drivers, um, just they would look at me and they would go, you know, I would get the, oh great, I gotta look after her too, and the drive to the truck, um, or, you know, just they, they weren't sure, they could see, I could see that they were uncomfortable. 
you know, it's a big truck, it's dangerous. The, you know, driving trash is, you're working with hydraulics, you're working with other people on the road, obstacles, and, you know, you usually have someone on the back of the truck, you work in teams. And so I had to very quickly prove, listen, I didn't get my CDL because I'm cute. I got it because I learned to drive a truck. I can do this job, that's why they hired me. So my biggest obstacle was like getting the men that I work with to realize that, to relax and to say, you know, I don't have to open the truck door for you. No, we're, we're together in this. And I've actually, I can actually tell a story when I started driving across country. I was driving in the worst stuff you could imagine. They stuck me in Nebraska ice storms, uh, the Pacific Northwest. I mean, like, here I am, like, you know, white knuckled. There's an avalanche for you. Know, just what are you going to do? But I had a driver who was a driver. He was like my mentor for, he had been on the road for 30 years, hated snow, hated New England. He said the sun was different in New England. Um, he just, he, you know, he was just really set in his ways. And I remember we were driving and it was bad. It was, it was, the trailer was coming around. I was, you know, trying to stay focused and saying to myself, and he got up. And he went in the back and covered his head. <laughs> and he was done. He just was, the stress was unbelievable. And I just, I kept my cool and I made it to the next rest stop. And, you know, he gets, he's like, man, he goes, you're something else. He goes, I don't know half a dozen guys that wouldn't have just pulled over and cried. And I'm like, did we have a choice? Like, there was no choice. And so, and even in, like, in the trash industry, when you're out there and it's 117 degrees in your cab, you're sweating right next to the guy next to you. You know, you're, you're, you're a driver. That's what we are first, we're drivers. Then the gender comes into play. So my biggest obstacle was uh, breaking through and saying, hey, I'm your partner. I'm not just someone you have to take care of. I think we can probably all relate to that. During preparations for this session, Kim and I discussed a barrier that I'm sure everyone in this room can relate to. Kim, would you share that with us? Yes, this, this question is, I'm very passionate about this question because I, I put some thought into it. And the industry has been different, you know, 30 years ago to, to where it's at today. And the biggest barrier for me has been me, has been myself. Um, if you can imagine when you're in a room full of like this and you're the only female in the room, you start second guessing yourself. You start second guessing your decisions that you make. Is it the right decision? From, from the very beginning, from when I had to get my CDL, you know, if I got my CDL, am I going to be able to handle the workload? To if there's a promotion that is available, am I going to be able to get the promotion? Are they going to look at me? And if, Taking the chance, taking taking the risk. I had that that little voice going off all the time, saying the playing both sides, the the pros and the cons. And darn it, I catch myself doing it yet today. As far as that little voice going off and just second guessing. But again, where the industry was at 30 years ago today is definitely different. But it, it's something that it has made me work harder and become a stronger person because of it. And I just remember as a driver, I had, I had to outwork my coworkers. They were all men, so I had to show to them that you know what, women can pick up just as much trash as you can. And so I, I don't wanna brag, but I did hold the record for a while of picking up the most trash out there. Okay, yes, thank you. <laughs> but again, I think it's just that kind of environment that really pushes an individual, pushed me into just being, wanting to succeed, regardless if I am the only woman in the room. Playing on what Kim mentioned, treating others how we'd like to be treated, let's now learn how our panelists treat themselves. Dominica. How would you balance career, or I'm sorry, how do you balance career, personal life, and, pa and passions? Is there such a thing as balance? 
So I'm going to answer the second part of that question first. Yes, yes, there is absolutely a balance. And how do you achieve that balance? I will tell you, you definitely, at least in my world, have to prioritize and organize. Um, that is so important. You know, raising two children and being Catholic, I had Catholic guilt <laughs> because I was out quite a bit. Um, but I will tell you, organization, prioritization, and family. If it wasn't for my mother and father, you know, living close by to help with that balancing act, I could not achieve and be who I, you know, the career path that I, that I, you know, I struggled to achieve. Or I, I, and then I would say that also, you know, exercise, sleep, eat well. That was so important in the balancing. There were times where after, you know, we would have meetings and I knew Dominica's cutoff point was nine o'clock. Nothing good happens after 9 p.m. <laughs> so, you know, so I would, my, the advice that I would give definitely when you're balancing is, you know, and take time for yourself, whether you enjoy reading, taking a walk on the beach, and, de you know, definitely going for just some fresh air, making sure that you have a best friend at work, someone you can confide in. That helps with balancing, you know, the, the personal with the professional. And then, of course, you know, um, go after your passion, but you have to be intentional about it because if you're not, it gets away from you quickly. And when it gets away from you quickly, as a leader, you're not good to your people. You're not, look at, you know, when you go home, you have obviously less, to you're, you know, less tolerance, and, um, and it, but it can be achieved. Um, and, you know, and those are just some of those, the key, the key aspects of what I really strive for. Um, but the, but, Really, if you don't have a family, surround yourself with great people and friends that can help. Jennifer, as a fellow mother, you have mentioned the mom stigma. Will you share with us your experience as a parent and how you balance motherhood, a career, and your own personal passions? Mm -hmm. Sure. So I'm a relatively clumsy human being, so balance is like a challenge for me full time. Um, I think that um, I balance a lot with, um, you know, uh, dance parties, uh, you know, but, but in, in all seriousness, uh, surrounding yourself, uh, like Dominica was saying, with, with um, a, a village. I'm a single mom of two. My kids are seven and nine. Um, it's an amazing time for them. I love every phase of their life. And um, also as a Catholic, tons of guilt. So, uh, you know, and I think, and I, I, t I was taking a lot of advice from a lot of um, amazing women that I've come across in, in my path to, to here. And, um, and you know, the, the biggest uh, part is being present, um, being present when you're at work. Uh, for me, being present when you're at home, you know, putting away the phone for, you know, dinner or whatever it is and allowing that time to just connect with your family, with people that are around you, with friends, wherever you are, just being present in that moment and trying not to let all of the noise take over your your entire life. <laughs> but, um, and then, you know, and with uh, mom stigma, I think that that's changing a lot now as the industry is changing into a more like nurturing um, in environment where we're focused on more sustainability rather than waste. It's It kind of goes with the, the female theme of, of care, like mother nature, for example. So I, I feel like that it's, it's evolving in a way where um, people are more human to each other and understanding. So um, balance to me is also knowing when to say no because I want to be able to be so helpful and do so much for so many people. And then, you know, and then I realize like, why did I bite this, this much off? Like, you know, always, always, I bite off way more than I can chew. But, um, and knowing when to ask for help is really, really important. Um, and that's all. <laughs> Paige, the early hours of a driver can be challenging on a single parent. How have you balanced your personal and professional life? Holy cow, we have three Catholics up here. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness. Guilt, guilt, and guilt. Um, well, you know, my kids are older, um, so I'm, I, you know, with respect to that, I, I'm kind of uh, rediscovering myself now um, after 50. Yay, that is amazing, ladies. Nothing has felt better um, to sit here as a, you know, an older woman and just I, I have so it's a brand new playing field. But what I remember is, I mean, my days are are they're still 12-hour days. You still have to balance. But um, so I think of it like this. 
every morning, and my kids know this, do not talk to mom unless she's had coffee. <laughs> Don't do it. Like, I need that coffee to function. But I also know that after three or four days of, of 12 hours and stress and everything, you absolutely have to take a time out and nurture yourself. I mean, we're expected to be like a female, so we have a lot of stress, a lot of pressure, the home, the work, all of it, the money, the finances. You're a machine. You've got to oil that machine. You absolutely have to go get a massage. Who cares? Get your nails done. Go for a walk. Do something good for yourself. It's like an oil change for your soul. And then when you go back into that, you know, as a woman, just go back and you're fresh, you're ready. Your machine is, you know, maintenance. We maintain our trucks, we maintain our cars, maintain yourselves. Do something good for yourself so that you always are able to function at your best. We've learned so much about how these impressive women have come to the industry, been inspired, developed as a leader, and worked hard to maintain a balance. Now to close out our panel, uh, our panel discussion, we'd love to learn what advice would you have given to your 25-year-old selves or to women seeking a leadership role within our industry? Norma, what would your advice be? Well, my 25-year-old self would have never listened to me in the first place. <laughs> Let's go, let's go to what advice I, I would give to somebody uh, uh, coming into the industry. The first thing that I truly believe in that is knowledge is power. The more you know, not just about what you do, about the people you work with, what they know, you read the articles, you read about what's going on in the other part of the country, in the other part of the world, knowledge is truly, truly power. Listening is an art. You do not have to be the one that is speaking all the time. That's where all the knowledge comes in. By listening, you, you figure out what other people know and what other people don't know and how to, to come back around and make a statement. Don't be afraid to speak up, however. Be able, you know, but know what you're talking about and, and don't be, like I said, don't be, don't think just because they expect you to be the one talking all the time. It, it, the listening is a, is a really a good art. Uh, not everything is black and white. There is a lot of gray out there. No matter what somebody tells you, there is gray in that black and white. And the best way to recognize that gray is to um, polish your, your, um, your problem solving uh, abilities. Uh, if you can problem solve, you can problem solve a whole lot of gray in this black and white world and, 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 and make a solution for something that you really needed a, a solution for. Um, everybody makes mistakes. As long as you don't kill anybody or any multi-million dollar lawsuits, and don't think that nobody else ever made a mistake. Don't think that, you're, uh, that everybody else is smarter than you in the room because that goes back to that listening thing. If you listen long enough, you're going to realize sometimes, well, they're not, they may not be. You might need to be a brain surgeon and, and, and this whole bunch. So I think that's a good one. Network within the company. I think Dominica had referred to that too as well. Find somebody in the company. It doesn't have to be in your office. Maybe somebody that does what you do in another state or, or just make two or three friends that you can call and ask what's going on. Uh, and somebody that's willing to listen to you whine when, when you need a place to whine and you, and you be reciprocal and let them whine back to you because you don't need to be taking all this home with you. Uh, so it's good to have, it's good to have a friend somewhere else. One or I have like three or four that I call, but you know, but we all get together and, and curmudgeon each other, but don't take it home with you. Just have those friends. Uh, and, and probably my last thing is always do the right thing. Uh, your reputation is something you've got, and if, and if you don't keep it, it'll, that bad reputation will follow you for years and years. So always do the right thing. So. Perfect. Kim? I would love to be 25 years old again, just so you know. <laughs> but the biggest advice I would give myself is, is to definitely follow your dreams. And it's okay to fail. Um, and, and realize that when someone is telling you that you can't do it, you absolutely can do it. And if you have the passion and the drive, the sky's the limit. And I wish I would have learned that when I was 25. <laughs> but um, 
definitely don't be who be you mm -hmm. believe in you and and take those chances Paige mm, definitely uh, listen more um, definitely slow down listen um, and and be compassionate a little bit more probably I, I seemed when I was 25 to be in a rush quite a bit mm -hmm. but also uh, you know um, set the goals higher like don't set your yes. goals from where you've been you, you end up shortchanging yourself set them for where you want to be don't stop here because you think that's what you deserve I heard a story one time that Jim Carrey wrote himself a check for seven million dollars this is when he had like no money and a few years later he cashed a check for seven million dollars <laughs> so like set your goals high you know don't be afraid to say I don't want you know I want I want all of it mm -hmm. um, in trust and listen to your intuition you know you're don't be led around don't be pushed into decisions um, you know do what you think is right absolutely but um, you know just listen to that little voice inside yourself and and have faith in yourself don't say I can't like refuse I refuse to say I can't um, you can. If it has been done before you by someone else, it can be done by you. So there's the sky's the limit. That's definitely would be my advice. So I, I think, um, you know, the, the ladies up here have covered a lot of, a lot of the advice that we all understand to be true um, in, this, in this world and in this industry especially. Um, I, I feel like for me, um, it's that, you know, I have to, and I, and it's just like a constant reminder, you know, I, I would tell myself this at 25, 26, 27, 28, up to now 42, <laughs> um, but that I can't, you, you can't control every situation. Um, you don't have the ability to see how things are going to come out. Um, and, and when things aren't going the way that you had envisioned, um, you can control the way that you handle it. You can control the outcome on your end, how, how you want things to play out and try to, you know, be human. Um, give yourself a break. Uh, understand that you are going to make mistakes and that's fine as long as you learn from them and then improve and figure out ways that you can, um, not make those mistakes moving forward and, uh, and just try to, you know, better yourself. Um, but I think, um, I think that, you know, it, and also, you know, stop and listen. I feel for me, um, I was always in a room, you know, I went to a school with all, mostly men going to, you know, for engineering and then transitioning into the engineering world and then to the waste worlds, uh, not very different, um, as far as the ratio is concerned. And, um, it is refreshing to see all these, uh, female faces. Nice. <laughs> um, and the men too, of course. But, um, you know, uh, and just, uh, understanding that you don't have to prove yourself to every single person. So then, you know, you find yourself doing all the talking and you're not doing as much listening. So um, it is better in some instances to be a sponge and have your own confidence. Um, sometimes less is more. Um, and I think that's it. Dominica. All right. So, um, and I'm really speaking, I'm sorry, to the women in the group for just a second. I have two words for you, no fear, okay? Um, and I say that because we do think differently, and that's wonderful, and that's embracing. And organizations that have diversity and really are intentional about diversity, they see higher profits, higher inclusion, higher retention. No fear, because I had that fear, and I wouldn't say anything. I wouldn't speak up. I, was, I thought that my ideas were just not as, as intelligent, perhaps, or they weren't, you know, uh, you know, didn't have the right perspective, and I would hold back. And then, you know, as time moved on, I actually hired a coach, okay? I hired someone to help me, you know, branch out and break through, and I thought, that's okay. And just as of recent, I was in a meeting, and I said something that was a little different, and I stood proud about it. And I thought, I'm going to stand by what I thought, what, and, you know, even though there were some comments back that maybe some dis didn't disagree, I was okay with that. So I tell you no fear because that is so important. Your voice matters. It's strong. And believe in yourself. Be your own cheerleader. Um, those, that's the best advice that, that I would give um, you know, the females in this room. And yes, you two males. Um, but <laughs> and um, so that's, that's kind of wraps it up. I mean, 
all phenomenal advice. And if you took notes, I would like them afterwards. <clears throat> I'd like to thank each of our panelists for investing their time and participating in today's spotlight session, Boots on the Ground, a conversation with women in the waste and recycling industry. I'm gonna pause there for a second. Can we not give these women a huge round of applause? Throughout the planning of this session, I was personally inspired by each of your stories and I'm thrilled um, that, that you are open to sharing them. I'd like to now open the floor for questions. Um, so I think the panelists touched on really two important concepts uh, during the panel today and that's on authenticity and then this idea of imposter syndrome. So I think, you know, we've all experienced this and I think it's a lot easier to try and change yourself to fit a mold um, in terms of your behaviors and your traits of the person next to you. And when you're in a room full of men, right, those behaviors and traits are, are typically masculine traits. But it takes a lot more courage to stand your ground and to fight and to prove that the attributes that make you different are actually your greatest strengths. So what I'd like to hear from the panelists is how have you had to stand apart in your career in terms of your behaviors and your approach and how has that ended up helping you? Who wants to take that? I'll, I'll answer. <laughs> well, I'm sure everybody's heard the story about Ginger Rogers. She did everything a man did backwards and in heels. And I think that's, uh, that's what we women have to do. But once, but once everybody in the room, and it takes a while to prove yourself, but once it, uh, once you do prove yourself and they, and they see that you've had that first great, uh, life changing idea, you know, you, 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 then you're in the group then. So just, you know, try, like I said, try to just make sure you understand every part of what you're, you're meeting about so you can make those, um, those, uh, suggestions and ideas. And, and, uh, sometimes I, sometimes you tend to want to, Tell them what they want to hear. Don't tell them what they want to hear. Tell them what they need to hear. So, I would say that you don't want to be a bull in a china shop. Okay, um, you know that the behavior that you want to exhibit should be who you are. Because if it's not, you're not going to come across authentic. But I do think that creating relationships across, you know, the the board, whether it's with females, males, creating that relationship. And, but not, you know, not using command, but influence and um, try to find some common, you know, ground, something we can discuss. Reach out to a counterpart, perhaps for advice. Very authentic. You know, I've heard, I heard you speak on, on this subject matter. It was very intriguing. I'm kind of struggling with the situation. And by being open and honest and humble like that, I think it could forge that relationship. And then I think what you'd find is, there's probably even more cohesion than you find that you, there, you have uh, more things in common. But I do think that, you know, I have a 23 year old daughter and she's a bull in the china shop. And she has, she is very, um, very deliberate, intentional. She's gonna prove a point. And I tell her, I'm like, Nicole, that's fine, but just find your way in a subtle way, in a very, you know, uh, in a way that is, creates that more of a collaboration versus, you know, adversary, you know, an adversarial type of relationship. Uh, first of all, I'd like to say thank you. This has been the best session that I've attended this whole entire time. Um, um, so I would say um, you guys touched on a lot of different things that I felt. Um, Often, sometimes it's like, okay, just be quiet and listen. Um, sometimes it's like, okay, speak up. Um, I think that sometimes because they're so passionate, um, it comes off as very emotional. Mm -hmm. And I think that the men and sometimes in the room are like, oh, here we go again with the emotion. Or, you know, sometimes my voice is cracking and it sounds like I'm going to cry, but it's, it's really because I'm upset and I'm trying to get my point across. How do you find the, the balance? Because I think that's what I struggle with. Sometimes I feel like, you know, no, I have to make my point. I, you have to hear what I have to say because you're not doing the wrong, the right way. It's, it's the wrong way. Um, but then sometimes I'm just quiet and I'm, it's like I'm not in the room and I, and I struggle with the balance. So when listening, I hear 
all of those things, um, but how, how do we find the balance to be heard and demand the respect that you need, but not come off so aggressive where they automatically don't hear you because it's kind of that, that woman yapping in, in the background, so to say. Please. Absolutely. Well, I take that one. <laughs> um, okay. So, abs- you know, it's so funny. I have uh, some, some friends that are in operations in the waste industry, and they have had the challenges of that. You're the female. You know, the guys have their club. Sorry, guys. I know you guys are like, oh, my God. We're, we're, it's not a male bashing thing, but um, I'm sure you guys feel like <laughs> all this girl power. Well, guess what? That's how we feel. <laughs> when we're in a room full of men. Um, so, yeah, don't wait to express yourself. That is death. You know, be fully expressed. You know, there, you're in a room full of people, and there's always someone that's kind of thinking maybe the same thing as you. Mm-hmm. So don't wait. Be like that guy in the back that goes, yeah, but wait a minute, what about this? Right? And then the other part is to how you deliver to, you know, and I get the whole emotional thing where you're like, oh, I finally, can you listen to me, you know, I get it. But a lot of times that's because you've waited too long. If you just are, be cathartic, be fully expressed. If they're talking about something, don't stay quiet and wait until three or four days later to where you're like this and you just, it comes out in emotion. Mm-hmm. Be calm and deliver your opinion and your side and you'll get respect. If, you know, we are emotional beings. My God, I am, yeah, I've had moments on the truck where my hair caught fire because I wasn't being heard, but you don't have to get to that point. And also how you say it, how you deliver, you know, like I just had a thing this morning with my kids, I'll share you, uh, one of my eight children had a, a meltdown because his sister said, you need to learn. You know, that didn't go well. So how else do we say that? Well. Um, it would be helpful if you did this, like how you deliver mm-hmm. to your male counterparts. If you go at them, like aggressive, like I want to be heard, so a lot of times the wall comes up. They, you know, here we go, like you said. But if you're like, hey guys, what about this? Or ask, do you guys want to hear my opinion? You know, what are they going to say? No, that would make them look like idiots, right? No, they can say, okay, let her talk. But, and then it's your delivery, your timing, all of it, because you really do, as females, need to try your best to omit that emotional outburst that we tend to have when we have waited too long to be expressed. And I'd like to add to that, too. Um, so, you know, I, I find uh, a lot of the emotion comes from um, our ability to take a situation and hear the information that's being presented to us, but then understand what the consequences are going to be in, in like real time, really fast. All the, th- the thoughts are flooding and you're freaking out because you don't want something bad to happen, right? So you're trying to hedge that off um, in some way. So um, it's it's also helpful for, I found it to be helpful when dealing in situations like that um, to try to ask questions to to that end point what i'm worried about and then say okay you know can i ask like what what do you think about this or what what if um you know what's the what's the end goal and then you know try to try to back into what you know the concern is without um having to come off as emotional and then I always, when I have like a difficult uh, situation, I just smile at the same time and I feel like it softens up whatever I was gonna say. Um, and not, not in a condescending way, but just to even calm myself down and be like, you know, don't take yourself too seriously. It's really okay, you know, so. I think if everybody just took some sales training up front. <laughs> sales training helps you to deal with all types. And I think that should be a standard for anybody anywhere that has to deal with other people. Because you'll learn how to ask those open-ended questions. You'll learn how to uh, make them come around to the way you think. Um, there's, there's, there's a whole lot of value, no matter if you're an accountant or an operations person. Uh, it teaches you how to talk to people and how to get them to come a- away from it thinking the same way you do. So if you ever have a chance to take some simple um, sales training, simple things as being familiar with what's on their walls and asking questions or, or the old time mirroring and sitting the same way and, you know, just, <laughs> you know, there's all kinds of little techniques, you know, and that'll really help you, uh, uh, as a woman, um, figure out what to do in those kind of situations. I also, just to add, uh, was told early on that there's no crying in the garbage industry. So what are you doing? 
But I do believe that your the deliverance and having the, the confidence when you are speaking is extremely important. And even though they may not take your advice or your suggestions, at least you feel better when you're able to at least get it out in the open. The sun? Yeah, hello. Uh, I, <laughs> I agree this is one of the best panels that I've attended at the conference. Uh, you're all very, very accomplished and inspirational professionals. My, my question is, I think every single one of us in the room, in our professional lives and our personal lives, have opportunities to be mentors. And my question uh, to you is, what are your thoughts on how we can all contribute to advocacy of bringing more women into our industry, particularly young women, while they're sort of going through that process of trying to make career decisions? Um, so at uh, Bayshore, we uh, do a lot of internships. So we every I, I built it into my business plan to have, um, you know, I, an intern. I do data processing, uh, looking through um, analysis and training them on uh, like the bottom up uh, and how how the inner workings of a you know a recycling company um, functions. And um, and that's been amazing. And you know uh, it's best human qualified. It's not just uh, for women, but um, but we find that more women are um, applicants in that uh, to to the internships and everything. So and it's so much fun to work with the students. Um, they come back and like write us notes about you know how they were able to actually use their information in their next job and and then apply it at school like during college and what you know uh, it connects the dots for them so um, you know uh, things like that and then um, any time that you know uh, we we have anybody that wants to come there's uh, several people at our company that uh, do uh, absolutely take on um, that mentorship m mentor role um, it's you know it's re it's really really Nice. <laughs> so, so I would say that you can do it formally, like, you know, as you had stated, because we also have management trainee programs. You can do it in a very formal basis, um, identify the men mentors up front. Not everyone's a mentor. Not everyone likes to be a mentor, right? So you definitely want individuals who have that innate ability. They, they enjoy doing that. Or you can do it very organically and naturally. And I think that also works very well. And I, I say that because we need to know, as we you know, as individuals are entering our organization, and look, there are many millennials and Generation Zs. The baby boomers are fading out, and then you have, they want a coach, they want a mentor. And I promise you, if we don't have that in place, then you're gonna see higher degrees of, you know, uh, of of them leaving, um, less retention. So I would say it's, um, I really like the formal way because I think that's very important in identifying those mentors and pairing them up uh, with that discipline, but also informally knowing, knowing the people that are coming into your organization and therefore via you know emails and introduction and then people reaching out to, and say, to say, look, I want a mentor, I want to, you know, if you have any, if you, need any advice or if I can help you and let's let's do this and be intentional about it. Every other week we're gonna have a 30 minute call because I have the experience in sales and I'd really enjoy discussing my, you know, my my past with you. I found that that works very effectively when you set that that time frame where you can, it's just you and that person. So um, I do think organizations can do it both ways and it both ways be very effective. Hi, uh, it's not a question, just a uh... Thank you. Uh, as a former sanitation worker, uh, I can attest to one, the best driver I ever had was a female. <laughs> and two, the best partner I ever had uh, was a female. But I just wanted to acknowledge you ladies uh, because as I was sitting here, I took a picture of you all and I sent it to my daughter because she's thinking about starting some waste collections. And, she was, and I was like, hey, all these women are like leaning in their fields and waste and, and, and doing things and there's no guys on stage. And she was like, you're not on stage? I was like, no, it's not <laughs> for me. It's for women. And she just texts back like, do you think I could be one of them? Oh, and I was wow. like, if they're up there, you can be up there. So I just wanted to definitely say that representation matters in this industry and while the first thing we think about is a guy in boots and a safety vest we definitely need the nurturing parts of women in this industry so thank you again so my my question is for Paige um, <laughs> and I ask it from 
the perspective when I entered the industry, I was doing environmental sampling and all of the gloves, the latex gloves, were large or extra large, okay? <laughs> <laughs> and so the twine, I get the twine all caught up in the little extra part of the finger that, of the glove that didn't fit my finger. I'm wondering from your experience inside a cab, do you have um, suggestions or have you been able to voice suggestions that would make it easier for women working in a cab? Or maybe you didn't have any such physical. Oh yeah, I did. Oh, absolutely. So I'm five foot two. Um, so I remember putting my air ride seat up and going, is that as far as it goes? Because I still, <laughs> um, but yeah, no, okay. So I actually um, spoke with a high vis and glove supplier um, here at the expo. And I was like, show me what you got. These, I have a size four finger, what do you got? And you know, there's still challenges, but um, it's coming up there. They have female high vis gear now. Um, I remember my first high vis vest, I had like elastic bands and duct tape and you know, taper on the gloves and you're like, holy cow, can I, you know, tractor supply? I used to have to go to all these different places, you know, cause girls like horses. So that's where I bought my gloves cause it's a, a girl thing, right? No. And leading in the industry, they are, they're catching on ladies. <laughs> We're getting some, some, you know, female friendly, size friendly, um, uniforms and, and personal protection equipment, which is vital. I mean, I, I can't tell you how many times I've gotten out of the, the truck and my hard hat went rolling because it doesn't fit. I mean, I just, <laughs> but yeah, no, it, it's, it's vital. And the more, the more women that are coming into the industry, you know, we are the change right now. It's really starting to, it's really starting to fast track. There are some, some new, when I started, I was the only girl. And then there was another and another. And then she told her friends, like, talk about it. Tell the girls, inspire your daughters and your sisters or your women that are, you know, in situations where the, now they have the absence of a man in their life. You know, say, hey, you can do it. You know, absolutely, I, I absolutely, I, I see the change coming in this industry. I see these beautiful women who, you know, through this ability to, to be in this, this world, in the waste industry, we're, we're buying houses, we're, we're in charge of our own lives. You know, as women in general, um, over the past hundred years, we've come a long way. My God, have we come a long way. I mean, you go back to just, can you imagine the right to vote? Right, and now we're driving trucks and leading companies and female sportscasters. And um, I think the the more that this is taking place, the more it's going to be accepted. The more change you're going to see. The gloves, the this, the that. So, but don't be silent. Do not be silent, and do not ever be afraid to do something. Like encourage. Women are very powerful. Um, everything that we do, we are the mothers. We we drive maternally. My truck. Uh, my kids are gone. They're all grown. So my truck was my baby. You know, we just, we're, we're more eyes on because we're the problem solvers. I mean, coin the phrase, go ask your mother. It's because we are the ones that orchestrate it. So as females, we bring an incredible asset to the industry. So yeah, absolutely, go get it, girls. So I have a really quick question. Um, I work for the Environmental Services Department, which is very, um, there's maybe a handful of women, right? And, um, I'm fortunate enough to work for an assistant director who is very innovative. So we've um, we've been going through a lot of things the past four or five years where we've trying to go on paperless when it comes to like the drivers and just implementing a lot of different things. We've tried to always include the drivers and everything, right? So we'll get a subject matter expert, you know, one of the drivers, and then we may have one who may be not as tech savvy. And we literally sit down from design from start to finish and we try to include them in the process when we, before we roll out things and implement projects. My question is, um, we usually get a lot of pushback because as drivers, you know, they don't want to use a tablet. They don't want to press the button. Um, we've even tried to kind of sell it to them like, hey, it'll make it easier. So some of you guys don't have to get off the truck. You know, you can use the automated arms. Like we've, we thought that we were pretty much doing everything that we can to make it simpler, you know, easier for them. Um, and looking at some things, we're probably gonna do another change in the next few years. So I'm probably expecting more pushback. And my question to you is, when it comes to innovation and just trying to 
like sell it to the driver and of course make it make them understand that it's easier for them that we're trying to make their jobs easier like what recommendations would you have for that when it comes to the drivers boy i tell you um as a driver, you know, you're trying, you have to, you know, look at the road, look at the people, what's the truck, what's my fuel level, where am I going, what's my day, can I get home by 2.30, you know, uh, am I going to break down if I am, how are, if there's a million things going through your mind. Um, don't, uh, this sounds kind of harsh, but, you know, it is what it is. This is the way we do things now. Uh, I went from my, my very comfortable paper, paper route sheet that I checked off, I loved it, you know, I could do, I could write on it. Well, guess what? you know, do something uncomfortable every day. I heard that from a very intelligent woman and she was right. Tablets are uncomfortable, but eventually my tablet became my friend. Don't give them an out. Don't give them a, an opportunity to, to vote on it. This is the way it is. Just, you know, like a lot of things, you have to, you either have to conform and, and, and roll with the change or you're gonna get left behind in the dust. I mean, they're, they're, it's not just tablets, but we had drivers that didn't like GPSs. They wanted to map everything. Come on, across country, please. So, you know, it, it, technology is scary. It's new. Uh, I'm 54. My kids fix my phone. I, you know what I mean? So a tablet, I was like, oh, I hate this. So, no, do, do not give the choice. This is the way it is. We need you guys on board. And then, you know, sometimes if you want to do, you know, an incentive or... If one person's doing it, maybe if the lady's doing it and she's successful at it, the guys will follow. But don't let toxic negativity from someone who's stuck in their routine stop the implementation of technology, which makes the, the job easier as a whole. You took the technology on to benefit the company. Don't let a driver tell you he doesn't want to do it. Don't give him a choice. Mm. Hi, my name is Katie Evans. I'm with the National Waste and Recycling Association. I'm actually the manager for the Women's Council. So first, I want to thank Sam. Can we give Sam a round of applause? Yes. <laughs> and I want to thank our Professional Development Committee for coming up with this panel. Many, many hours were put together, many, many nights where we were trying to figure out how to converse, make this conversation meaningful to the industry but actionable, walking away with what you can do and what we can move forward. And so um, thank you. Let's give a round for the, the Professional Development Committee. The Women's Council is on fire. And if you want more information about joining us, please come find me or any of our members. Um, if you want a chance to win um, the split ticket, uh, find any of my members. They will be proudly, will, will sell you some, some tickets to help support us to continue this conversation and continue to bring women to our end within our industry. Um, and if you guys still have any questions you want to talk or have a conversation, please feel free to come to the stage and, and speak and continue the conversation with our panelists. But um, thank you so very much. Let's give them one more round of applause. Thank you. <laughs> and have a great day at Expo.